Hello, and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment the podcast. I'm your host, Phil Friedrich, and today I am honored to have Phil Cook with me. Phil is an author, a writer, and a uh, public speaker now. He's also the owner of the Cook Media Group, and one thing that really stood out about his story is his belief that as a door closes, it's truly just an opening to the next opportunity. So, Phil, thanks so much for being on today. Hey, I'm thrilled. And and by the way, it's a great premise for a podcast. I love your podcast. I don't think people think enough about those pivotal moments that can send your life off in a completely different direction and or confirm the direction you're on. So I just I, I could listen to those stories endlessly from people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And while we're talking today, I want people to be able to look you up. So where would people yep. be able to find you on social medias or online? Probably my the best place is philcook.com, my blog. I'm cook with an E, so it's P-H-I-L-C-O-O-K-E. And uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter at, at philcook. And it's Phil Cook page, I think, on Facebook. You can Google me and all this stuff will come up pretty easily. P phil Perfect. Cook. <laughs> Perfect. Well, good. So, Phil, to start your story. Um, yeah. You had a dad who was a pastor. And so, you know, there's certain uh, societal pressures that come with being a pastor's child. But talk a little about growing up in a home where dad yeah. was a pastor. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I never had a moment's feeling, calling, you know, dis decision to make to become a pastor. But I grew up behind the scenes at church. I mean, we I mowed the cemetery. We had a hundred year old cemetery at the time, and and I learned as a kid mowing the grass that uh, those most of those graves were those caskets were wooden, and over a hundred years they rot. And I was mowing. I'll never forget. I was mowing one grave one time, going over the top of the lawnmower, and it collapsed. And we, me and the lawnmower, both fell into this grave. And uh, you see stuff as a 10 or 12 year old that, oh man, I, you probably shouldn't see. And my dad panicked and he said, Phil, you got to you gotta cover that over. You got to fix that before the family sees. And <laughs> man, I, I was 12. So I got concrete blocks, broken lawn chairs, uh, wood, whatever I could find, bags of leaves. And I filled up the hole, <laughs> covered it over with a little dirt. And um, I, it's just... <laughs> You know, the things you do behind the scenes at a church, everybody <laughs> thought we had magnificent bells in our steeple, but it was just me climbing up at six o'clock every day through a ladder into the steeple, playing a 33 RPM album through big giant speakers. So, um, yeah, it was an interesting experience growing up behind the scenes at a church. Yes. Now, as you're growing up and, and you're getting older, um, something that you took a liking to was kind of filmmaking. And so yeah. you and some friends in high school would start making movies. So talk a little bit about where that passion came from and what some of the movies you were uh, creating were. Uh, well, we, we, they weren't Academy Award winners, I can tell you that. Then this is the day before home video. So I got my dad's Super 8 movie camera. Some of you listening will remember it was a three minute film reel. And um, we didn't know anything about editing, but we started telling stories and we did mafia movies, space movies, army movies, um, you any anything you could think of. And the funny thing is when uh, it never crossed my mind that this is something I would eventually do for a living. Yeah. Uh, we just had fun. And when I went away to college, I took my I thought, well, I'm going to take my films with me, take my dad's camera. I might find somebody that wants to make films there. And literally the first day, when a thousand miles away to college, the first day unpacking my suitcase, a couple of the movies fell out and a guy across the hall saw it and said, hey, I'm taking a film class. I can show you how to edit those things. And so that very night we went down to the film department and uh, we were working on our film. We were down there for three or four hours and I didn't even know you could cut film and <laughs> it's amazing. And uh, we're working away and I, I had no idea the film professor was there in the back of the room working on a project of his. And uh, he was leaving late into the evening and he was leaving and he stopped at our little t edit table and introduced himself and said, you know, I've been watching your little movie out of the corner of my eye and I've got students who have been taking film classes for three years that don't do this well. Yeah. He said, would you mind if I showed it in, your, in my class tomorrow? And I thought, well, yeah, I guess so. If, if I can sit on the back row and just see what they think. And, and trust me, it was no great film. <laughs> but uh, I sat on the back row the next day. They showed my movie and um after it was over, they talked about it. Mm. And I had this crystal clear, I don't know what to call it other than a moment of revelation. This, this idea came to me that if I can do something with a camera that makes people talk like this, yeah. this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. And I literally changed my major. I was a music major up at that point because, you know, as a preacher's kid back in those <laughs> days, playing piano was part of the job description. 
And um, I didn't know what else to do, but I literally changed my major that day and I've never looked back. Now, I, I want to highlight that kind of interaction with the professor sure. that's sitting in the back of the room and just asks, you know, hey, would would you allow me to show this? And, you know, I don't know if maybe you felt a confidence boost at that point in time, but I think oftentimes it takes somebody seeing something in us that maybe we didn't realize we had in ourselves. So maybe highlight that for you and oh, yeah. maybe times in your life where that's been the case that someone's really seen that in you before you it's it's true he was the first person that that, that knew what he was talking about i mean he was a professor he, he, <laughs> he'd been teaching film for years and years and years and and making films on the side and so i think it probably you could say it was the first time i'd ever had somebody that knew what they were talking about actually say something good about one of my movies and I mean, you know, other people, you know, the family thinks it's great, but they're a family. They don't know anything about movies. And, and I'll tell you, the lesson I've really learned from that experience is 25 years later, I looked him up. He had long retired in Southern California, lived yeah. in Pasadena. And when we moved out here um, back in 91, we moved out here. I looked him up and I tracked him down, went over to his house. We sat on the front porch and I literally <laughs> told him how that you know that's a that introduction that little moment uh, yeah. changed my whole life changed uh, my whole life and and launched my career in film and at that point i'd filmed in about i don't know 40 countries around the world and i've gone on to film in about 70 and and uh, it's just interesting and I, and I always encourage people people that have that kind of impact on you you need to track them down and let them know years later you know let them know the impact it made because it really really i mean we cried a little bit on his front porch and it was just interesting and it wasn't but a few months after that until he died wow. and i always was so grateful that i was able to get to him before he passed to share a little bit about how how much that had meant to me that's awesome so there's a call to action everyone that's listening yes I, think of somebody in your life that's had an impact and reach Absolutely. out to them, send them a text give them a call write them a letter whatever it is you need to do uh to just share with them how impactful they've been to you now as your story continues to progress so in yep. college right you focus on um getting the degree in you know, production and in yeah, movie production making. Now, as you are graduating, I would imagine that that's a pretty complicated industry to get into. I'm sure there's multiple really people hard. that want to get in there. So how did you crack into that and how did doors open there? I had a really serious girlfriend that I'd met my sophomore year, her freshman year, uh, Kathy. And um, she she lived in she grew up in Las Vegas and we met at a church service. We called it a Vesper service back then. It was a Sunday night service on campus. And um, I, I just randomly sat next to her. And she was this is like 1973. She was wearing a pink corduroy pantsuit, uh, you know, patent leather, white patent leather platform shoes. I thought she was the hottest thing on two wheels. I'd never seen anything like this woman. And it took me three months to ask her out. And um, remember, this is before iPhone. So <laughs> I called her and asked her out. She said yes, but I found out later it was only because she thought I was somebody else. She she thought I was another Phil. <laughs> and um, you you have no idea what it's like to walk to the dorm to pick up this girl and this look on her face like, oh, no, it's that guy. <laughs> and uh, so we didn't start out well. It took me a while to kind of build the momentum back. And uh, but by the time I graduated, I, she was a year behind me. And I thought, I'm going to come to L.A., seek my fame and fortune, came to L.A. In those days, it was really hard to break in the business. It was almost all unionized. There wasn't the independent production that we see now. Yeah. And so you had to be somebody's relative to get into a union. And I, I, I was here for about nine months. I worked for little small production companies. I was a runner. I was a dolly pusher. I was a sandwich getter, whatever I could do. And, but I realized I was getting married. We had, I'd, I'd proposed to Kathy and, and we were getting married. So I needed a real job. So I went back to the Midwest and um, we were there for about another six or eight years, um, you know, raising our family and, and uh, getting started, but it gave me a regular job. I was still working in television, but it was a little more regular job. And, um, and then eventually we came to LA. Now, I, I want to highlight the fact that you were willing to do some of those minute tasks for the opportunity of what oh, yeah. you wanted to do. Uh, I think oftentimes, right, we see where we want to go, but we forget all the steps that it could take to get there and the yeah. buck that it's taken for some of the greatest to get to right their their echelon of success. So talk about, True. you know, being willing to go through the, you know, the, the not fun parts of the job to get to the opportunities <laughs> to have the fun parts of the job. 
Oh, it's so true. And, and it's kind of a tradition in the film business that you start out as a gopher, you know, go for this, go for that. Uh, you get sandwiches, you become a production assistant and you slowly move up. You know, people see your talent. Um, you know, the thing I learned early on uh, when I was a production assistant is I need to be the first person on the set in the morning and the last person that leaves at night. Wow. And um, you just need to show that kind of motivation and commitment and hustle. And that's the way you move up the ladder. And so it is, it's really true. And I have, I've often told people that, that, you know, the, if you're willing to do the jobs, no one else wants to do, that's the secret of moving up the ladder, you know, take the, take the tough jobs, the jobs, everybody else turns down the really stupid jobs that nobody wants. You take those because that's going to put you in a position to get noticed and it'll make a big, big difference. So I think bosses are always looking for people that will do those kind of things that may not be glamorous may not be, you know, get you in front of a lot of people, but somebody's watching. I, I always feel very strongly that whatever you're doing in life, somebody's watching and um, be at your best and give it your best commitment. And it can make a huge difference. It certainly did for me. That's amazing. And I, I like to think back to Phil as a young man uh, climbing up and uh, playing the music at 6 a.m. through the bells and thinking that might have been the beginning of some of the work ethic. It could, it could have been, or it might've been fill, filling those millions of uh, communion cups, uh, you know, with <laughs> Welch's grape juice behind the stage. But uh, yeah, that, that was a lot of that stuff going on back in those days. Yes. Now, as you're really working into that industry, you get, you start to have some success and you get a phone call or a letter asking you to come have a conversation with a gentleman yeah. named Marty. So talk a little bit about this interaction. Well, it took me after I came back to the Midwest, it took me a while to, 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 you know, get, get, get into the business in a big way. And I ended up being, a, a doing a lot of writing, a lot of commercial producing, a lot of directing, things like that. And so the interesting thing was I'd built up a reputation doing advertising and um, I got a call from, you know, Sid and Marty Croft were famous for their children's programs originally, uh, HR Puff and Stuff and Sigmund the Sea Monster. And then they moved up to primetime programming. They produced the Barbara Mandrell show. They produced a lot of stuff. In fact, I think at the time uh, when I met Marty, um, he was probably producing more primetime programming on, on NBC than anybody. Wow. And so he called, he called through a mutual friend and asked if I would write a series of commercials. I think it's three spots that would launch a new show he was working on. So, I mean, this is a big chance for me. I thought I'm, I'm, I'm in the Midwest and this is my chance to come back to Hollywood with great glory. And uh, so I spent weeks writing the spots and it came time to come out and present them to him. This was before the internet. So I had to fly out and pitch it to him. And um, I came out to the studio, Sunset Gower Studios here in Hollywood. I'll never forget. And, and I walked past a, literally about 12 desks of secretaries and assistants to get to his office and uh, lay the script down on his desk. He didn't ask me to sit down. Um, it was really <laughs> awkward. And uh, he read over the script. And um, needless to say, he was not happy. He did not like this at all. There were there were quite a few expletives uh, uttered <laughs> and uh, he was profanity was very comfortable for him. And so he let it rip, yeah. let it rip. And uh, he said, I can't believe I brought you out here for this. I, I, wow. I hired you for this kind of crap. Only he didn't say crap. Um, it was just he just went on and on. And yeah. I was just devastated. I mean, I thought, oh, my gosh, when's the next flight back to the Midwest? And he paused for a minute. This really, so I'll never forget it. He paused for a minute and said, you know what? But I've heard you're better than this. Mm. Now I'll tell you what, I've got to go to a recording session across the street. I'll be there for about an hour. He said, uh, when I come back, um, I want to see new spots. He said, there's a conference room down at the end of the hall. The girls outside will get you anything you need, sandwiches, you know, legal pad, typewriter, whatever. And um, he said, but when I come back in an hour, I want to see three new scripts. And I thought, oh man, there's, there was my moment. And so I went down the hall. I don't, think I used a single word from the old scripts and the new ones. And I, you know, it, that's a tough moment because yeah. I've got an hour. You talk about the clock ticking. Um, I had an hour to rewrite three scripts that had taken me weeks to come up with. Yeah. And, but in that, that moment, I uh, came through I, literally an hour later, his secretary poked her head in my, my, in the door and said, you know, Mr. Croft is back. He'd like to see the scripts. So with great trepidation and heart pounding, I walked down the hallway, gave him the scripts. He still didn't ask me to sit down. And um, he read them over and he paused for a second, put them on his desk and said, all right, now this is what I'm talking about. This will work. This is good. 
And um, it, it kind of, it was the origin, and I, I talk about it in the introduction, it's the origin of the, the, my most recent book, um, Ideas on a Deadline, How to Be yes. Creative When the Clock is Ticking. Because what happened in that room? What happened in that hour that I'd spent weeks working on it and it wasn't any good, but in that moment when the clock was ticking, I had a hard deadline and or I was gonna go back to the Midwest, um, what happened that made me come through and come up with the right thing? So that's always fascinating to me because broadcast TV, uh, even you know podcasting like you're doing right now, we're always on schedule. We're always up against the clock. We're always having to deliver on time. And so I've saw there was many books out there on creativity, but just not that many on how to be creative under pressure. And so that's that was the genesis of that book. And it really had a profound impact on my life. Yeah. Now, one, everybody go check out this book, Ideas on a Deadline. But <laughs> but two, you know, I want to highlight the fact that you didn't just get this inflated ego, right? Marty, what, right. what do you know? I've created a reputation for myself. You flew me out here, right? You're telling yeah. me my stuff's not good because I think <laughs> that could happen very easily, right? Like, hey, if you don't think this is good, then forget it, man. You know, I will take that flight back. But you said, all right, I got an hour. Let's regroup and let's get after again. So yeah. talk a little bit about, you know, bringing ego out of the situation, right? And just focusing on the task at hand. I think the ego comes about largely because we're insecure. Mm -hmm. I've, in my career, working with creative teams and creative people, I've discovered that the most insecure person in the room is the one that gets the most offended. The one that, you know, says, screw you. I'm, I'm out of here. I, I, you know, if it's not good enough for you, you're an idiot and walks out the door. And it's largely due to their insecurity and they're lashing back. They're defensive and they're, they're, they know it's not good, but they, they're embarrassed to let themselves down. And I just learned yeah. early on that the, the humble route, people out there actually want to help. People want to yeah. help. And when I'm surrounded with a creative team, I want a team that I could admit guys, I've hit a wall here. I don't know what I'm doing. What mm. can you help me? And they jump in there and will do some amazing things. And so uh, that's a real, I, I'm constantly working with creative people, encouraging them to get over that insecurity. And, and insecurity yeah. happens for a lot of reasons. It may have happened in your childhood, the way you were raised, just a lot of different experiences you've had, but it's a crippling, crippling thing. I've seen leaders who destroyed their career because they could not get past that insecurity. And uh, it does make a huge difference. And so I just think being humble, you know, accepting your limitations uh, and, and really honoring the people you're around. I mean, mm -hmm. Marty, you know, we didn't have the same lifestyle. We didn't have the, you know, we had very few things in common, but he was major league in the industry here in an industry I wanted to break into. And so I knew, I'm, you know what, I'm going to, I, I want to work with him. I could learn a lot from this guy. And it ended up, I, it was amazing what I learned over the, uh, over the following years, just being around him. So it yeah. is interesting um, when you, yeah, I think you're onto something with that. It's, it's really true. You need to, to at least be humble enough to accept criticism from other people without being hurt. Yes. Now, I don't want you to tell us the whole research of what you found when you're writing your book, but I would be curious to know, was there anything that really stood out to you about why some people under pressure perform well and why others don't perform well? Or was there any yeah. kind of synopsis that you ended up having from, from writing the book? It's it's true. And I can tell you working here in Hollywood, working in Addison, with advertising agencies in New York, there are people that are brilliant, but they're paralyzed when the, that comes to a deadline. Yeah. And the truth is when you embrace deadlines, they, you know, I'm going to tell you the dirty little secret in my life is I love deadlines. I don't even start a project until I see the <laughs> deadline looming in the distance. You know, it's yeah. something about the fear. It's something about getting your blood pumping the adrenaline going. Uh, it's just amazing what happens when I see that deadline coming. In fact, Orson Welles, the great film director who wrote, uh, who produced Citizen Kane, some consider the greatest movie ever made said the absence of limitations is the enemy of art. Mm. So we do need boundaries. We need yeah. limitations. And so I think that's a really important thing. But one of the things I discovered is there are a lot of myths about creativity. And I think that causes a lot of people to, to struggle with deadlines. For instance, you know, so many people think that some of us are born creative and some of us aren't. But in my research, I discovered there's not a shred of evidence that says some people are creative and some aren't. It's, it's amazing. You put a, put a bunch of little kids together in a room and they're all wildly creative. There's not, you know, you don't say, Oh, that guy's going to be the accountant, you know, and this yeah. guy's going to be Mr. Boring. They're super creative, but there is some studies that indicate that about age six, we start losing our creativity, which yeah. is says something to me about our school system. Is it, what is it about our school system that makes us start to lose our creativity? And, and ultimately it's a muscle. And if 
we're not being creative, we, we don't exercise it, if we're not engaging with people, uh, we will eventually lose it. But first of all, there's, there's, you know, anybody listening who feels like I was not born creative, that's a myth, total myth. Yeah. And, and another myth is, you know, you, a lot of people feel like I have to wait for that aha moment that eureka moment. You know, I, I have this presentation due on Tuesday and, you know, if I had another week, it'd be great, but I'll come up with something. It'll be mediocre, but I'll come up with something. Well, that's crazy. There's no reason that you can't come with up with a breakthrough idea you need when you need it. And really my book is about the kind of techniques and ideas that will open up that kind of thinking in your life. And so it is an interesting thing to study uh, and, and, you know, how you, how you come up with these moments. There's a lot of different techniques we can talk about, but it's just really interesting when you get into creativity, particularly and start talking to people that thrive under pressure. You know, I, I produced two Super Bowl commercials. Yes, and I learned yes. pretty quick. I, I learned pretty quick. They're not going to delay the Super Bowl because I can't come up <laughs> with a good enough idea for a TV commercial. So, uh, you know, we have to think about those kind of things and, and learn to, to live with deadlines. Yes. And so you're exactly right. You did produce multiple Super Bowl ads, which is a phenomenal opportunity and certainly has to be a highlight of you know different things you've been able to produce. And your career is going well. And yep. then all of a sudden at 36, things change. Yeah. Yeah, I got fired. I got fired. It's interesting that, that after I had the experience with Marty, I mean, he didn't offer me a job because television is a show to show to show kind of a thing. Yeah. And this was for an advertising campaign. And, and um, we kept the relationship, but went back to the Midwest. I had my wife and, and two young daughters and um, we went back to my normal job. And um, I, I, one day um, the the founder's son, you know, he stepped in, took over and wasn't crazy about my ideas and, um, you know, called me in one day and fired me. And the interesting thing was I knew I was supposed to come to LA. I, I'd known that for years, but I can rationalize anything. You know, our kids were in good schools. We had great friends. We had a good church we were involved in. Um, and I kept thinking, you know, I'm supposed to go to LA, but maybe I can commute. And finally, I remember doing a, a T a movie trailer uh, for Disney and yeah. uh, for a big movie they were releasing. And I did seven round trips in two weeks to wow. I'd edit, I'd come back and show them a version. I'd edit, come back and show them a version. And we did 21 different versions. And I realized in that experience, commuting is out of the question. That is just not, this was pre-internet and there's just no way I could make this work. And so it was expensive to move to LA and I kept hesitating. And I, I, I kind of jokingly tell people, I think God finally fired me. He yeah. wanted me to come to LA. So he just finally fired. So it wasn't the guy, it wasn't my boss that fired me. It was, I think it was God because it opened the door for us to get severance pay. We were, they, they offered to pay us severance, which gave me the money to move to LA yeah. and I got started. So I always, I like to encourage people that, you know, what you think may be a closed door is that actually something that's going to open up to a whole different level? I mean, it completely changed our life. We moved to LA, we launched our company, Cook Media Group, and um, we've been insanely bu busy ever since. And it's just been a remarkable thing. And I often look back and think, you know, if I'd had never had the courage to come to LA, if I'd never been fired, you know, where would my life be? A completely different trajectory. So it, I often think being fired was the best thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah. Or at least one of them. Yeah. Well, so there's a lot of things I want to dive into. Okay. One, so one is there, my guess is day one, when you found out you're getting fired, you didn't feel that way. <laughs> you didn't feel like, oh yes, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Like now, <laughs> now I feel free to go to LA. My guess is for a period of time, there was some, I don't know, frustration, maybe even a little bitterness or resentment that was built up uh, at that absolutely. moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I, I went home, told my wife, and we sat on the edge of the bed and cried for a little bit and looked at our options. And, but I'll tell you, this is interesting. I, I'd really sensed a, a year earlier that that time was going to come. And, and I, I mean, you have to be, I wasn't blindsided, although it was a shock when it finally happens, it's always a shock, but we had sold our house a year earlier and rented. And I thought, okay, we're going to rent a home so that when we do it, you know, the, if the moment comes that we feel like it's right to move, we're going to be ready. And so we started kind of unhooking all the, you know, permanent things in our life to get ready and get mobile. And we started having garage sales and, and thinning down and, um, so it wasn't, it wasn't, like I say, we, we kind of felt the time was coming, but it's always a shock when you walk in and the guy says, Hey, you're done as of this afternoon. And so, um, 
it, it but it it just worked out great it, it could not have been better yeah now the second thing you know not everyone that listens is a person that has a faith life um, but one thing that i found to be true in, in my life is that sometimes you know god or wh- whatever it is yeah. you align with they can only get your attention by the thing that you place with high importance and for me <laughs> i I was living a good life, but to get to the grade or the thing that I was probably truly called to, it was going to take my career having a little bit of a turn in the path that I wouldn't have ever chosen, but it turned it. And all of a sudden that sent me on a different trajectory, similar to yourself. So talk about that, you know, maybe from your standpoint and your experience, how, you know, God has worked in your life and maybe taking some of those things that are really important to you. And sometimes that's the thing that you have to adjust or change to get your attention. Absolutely. Um, and, and growing up in the church had an indelible impression on me. And I've always, you know, vi- you know, felt very strongly about spirit. I, I have a PhD in theology, which is weird for a television producer. Um, CNN, I was interviewed on CNN once and they said, Phil is the only producer in Hollywood with a PhD in theology, which kind of <laughs> makes me unique. And, yeah. uh, but I just, it's, it's because I love it. I just love studying that stuff. I'm a, I'm a lifelong student anyway. And um, we do work with a lot of Christian organizations, we work, work with a lot of nonprofit organizations, and I love speaking that language. But it's always been really important. And I have discovered, you're exactly right, the, the one place I never expected to go is the one place God usually points me in. And so it, whether it's getting fired, uh, we've lost clients. We've had very, very challenging times when we lost a really important client. But maybe six months later, that client did something insanely stupid. And um, I was so grateful we weren't caught up and tied up with that that person. Yeah. And um, there have been two or three situations like that. I've had employees that that didn't work out for us, and I felt really bad letting them go. But it didn't take long to realize that was the smartest thing I could have possibly done. So very often, you know, I don't think you're going to go very far in life if you're not willing to to confront the hard decisions and the hard choices. I I wrote a blog and uh, recently about. You know, what are the hard decisions you need to make in your life right now? Probably all of us have one that we keep putting off, that we keep ignoring, that we keep pretending like it's, you know, we can we can deal with that later. But the truth is, the sooner we bite the bullet and make that decision, the sooner we'll be able to go to the next level in our career. So I think you're exactly right. That's great. So we, we've unhinged ourselves from the Midwest. We decide, <laughs> hey, it's time to head out to, to L.A. And the, the idea of starting our own company is is at hand. So talk a little bit about, you know, hey, what the focus was in the beginning and how the company began to grow and what your focal point was. Well, I had a friend that worked at at Phillips Phillips Petroleum, uh, the oil company based in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And uh, they had a very sophisticated uh, video studio and a media team. And, and uh, he was the first person that called me after I got fired. And, and he really helped create a bridge that would get me um, get me out to LA and I did a number of projects for them. And, uh, we, we, when we moved, we actually stopped in Vegas for a while, because as I said, my wife grew up in Vegas and her parents were there and we thought, well, let's take the kids and we'll, we'll, we'll set up at their house. We'll live with them for a month while we start looking for a house over in LA. And, um, during that time, it was kind of funny during that time, I was introduced a friend of ours, who's a graphic designer, introduced me to the marketing director, at the Circus Circus Hotel. She yeah. ran Circus Circus, Excalibur, the Sahara, and also the owner of all three had a boat racing team. And so she said, we need a copywriter to help do all the ads and the promotions and stuff we're doing. So she hired me to write copy. And so it was a great freelance job while we were making that transition. And But the funny thing was, it, this was back in the days when Vegas was trying to be family friendly. And the Circus Circus Hotel was building what became the largest indoor amusement park in the world. It was all in a giant glass dome. They called it the Adventure Dome. And it was designed for little kids, like elementary school kids. And um, they came to me and said, okay, we're going to have this thing up in a few months. We need names for all the rides. And I'd never named amusement park rides before. Come on. And especially for little kids. And so I beat my head against the wall for probably weeks trying to come up with ideas. And I got nothing, just nothing. And so I finally realized, wait a second, this is for little kids. And my daughter, Kelsey, our oldest, was in second grade at the time. So I talked to her teacher and I said, look, can I have the kids for maybe an hour come in the classroom and talk to them for maybe an hour? She let me come in and do it. And I said, guys, we need to name some amusement park rides. And they went nuts. And I said, okay, so we've got a roller coaster that goes through the desert. 
canyon blaster some kid yelled at check got that <laughs> and then we just went, went down the list and they named every single ride in the amusement park and i did very little tweaking only just a couple little minor things literally the next day i took the list to the management team at circus circus and they approved everyone they didn't change a single name <laughs> and i i i have to admit i didn't reveal that my daughter's second grade class came up with the names but in in the in my book my creativity book i talk about the fact that look go to where the problem is if, mm -hmm. if you're coming up with an idea and you're stumped go to where the problem is find the people that will benefit the most from it and you don't have to come up with everything on your own you can share the burden with other people that will really get into it and so it, it really taught me a really important lesson about getting input from the people who would actually be using the product and it really changed how I, I look at creativity. So, yeah, it was an interesting experience. And to this day, it's funny, 25, 30 years later, we went to the amusement park and took our grandkids. Uh, this is like a year or two ago. And they still have the same ride. And guess what? They all have the same name. And that's a lifetime in the amusement, amusement park world. So it's just, just kind of, well, and they still don't know who named them. I hope you're getting a royalty on that. I hope you're getting a royalty. On <laughs> I wish <that. laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> now, something that I heard you talk about that I thought was extremely important to highlight here, you know, for some people that are sure. business owners or, you know, maybe have a company website was you said oftentimes people are using their website to uh, be a good example to their existing clients. Right. However, the new clients are coming through and being like, what the heck is this? That's and true. to your point, in today's day and age, it's it's the non-client that's going to look you up online before they ever come work Absolutely. with you. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that, because I think sure. that highlights your point of going to the problem, right? So go to the non-client and what do they want to see, not to the client and what are they trying to find out? This stuff is important. I mean, we live in this a digital age. And I think for leaders to not understand that would be like leaders, you know, in the past saying, well, I don't do books, you know, books aren't for me. Um, we've got to understand social media, websites, all those kind of things in this digital age we live in. And one of the issues I see a lot is it's true of businesses. It's true of nonprofits. It's true of churches. I yeah. tell pastors all the time, look, um, you know, they, they build their church website for the church members. Well, your church members never go to your website. <laughs> they know where the church is. They know who the pastor is. They know what time the service starts. They never go. But by the same token, I can guarantee you that virtually 100% of new visitors will check you out online before they come. So yeah. the website needs to be designed, like you say, for people that don't know your company, that don't know your church or don't know your nonprofit. What could you do that would make you so compelling that they would want to come and visit? They'd want to buy your product. They'd want to engage with you in some capacity. And so it's just the way, you know, we know it's funny. The digital world has really changed the way we think. You know, you probably are familiar with the famous Microsoft study that indicates uh, we, you know, our, our attention span is between about four and eight seconds, yeah. uh, which means when we meet somebody for the first time, we decide what we think of that person in the first eight seconds. And think about that. You haven't had time to talk to them, really get to know them. <laughs> But hey, I got things to do, man. I got text messages coming in. I got emails to send out. I got the phone ringing. And oh. we've just changed our behavior where we make decisions now about things we don't even know anything about. And so um, in the same way with churches, I tell pastors, I'm glad your sermon is great. I'm glad your service is fantastic. But in an eight second world, what's the parking experience like at your church? What does the lobby look like? You know, who's the first person a new visitor meets when they walk in the door? Yep. It's the same with a business. You know, what are your open doors? What are the first impressions somebody gets of your company or your nonprofit? Those kind of things. We have to think in that eight second filter in everything that we do. That's really good. So as you finish up the project in Vegas, um, yep. you, you end up doing a whole bunch of different projects and you've done a lot of cool things. I mean, you have a Hillsong opportunity, right? So yep. talk about what really gets the ball rolling after the Vegas experience for you and the business. Well, probably a couple different things. It's interesting that um, I, I, I always encourage people to, to even if you have a full-time job, we live in a world that's so volatile today, particularly in the workplace, that your resume needs to be up to speed. Your bio needs to be up to speed. You need to be networking with people, meeting people. You just never know. You know, my my dad's generation stayed in a job 30, 40 years. Yeah. That doesn't happen today. The statistics are just a matter of a few years for most people at a particular job. And so I had been really good about 
keeping relationships with different people and, and reaching out to people, even when I was full time. So when I ended up on the street, people knew me and I knew people and it made a huge difference. Like I say, my friend Jim reached out from Phillips, Phillips Petroleum. A couple churches needed to do a video project. Uh, a documentary guy needed to make a documentary. So I started getting calls from people and that's a really critical thing. And you need to play that on people. You know, it's funny, anything you do in life, I, I, I have a couple maxims and one is, you know, people skills are more important than the actual skill it takes to do your job. That's true uh, across yeah. the board. You know, if you, no matter how, we, we, I was partners at a TV commercial company for about seven years and we had TV commercial directors that were brilliant, absolutely visual geniuses. And they've got paid a lot of money to produce super high end commercials. And yet we had a few that had absolutely no people skills. I mean, it was so bad. We could not let them alone with a client without one of us being there. One of the owners being there, they just couldn't communicate. They can't talk. They're grumpy. They're, they, they just, they had no people skills. It just shocked me that you could be that talented and have no people skills, but I yeah. see it quite frequently. And so, you know, brush up on your people skills, your, your ability to inspire and motivate people, clients, bosses will have a huge impact on your career. And so that's really, I think a, a huge part of what got me going. And I was not afraid to call. I was not afraid to say, Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm free. I'm, I'm doing my own thing now. I'm freelancing at the time. And um, it's just amazing how that can kind of build and build and build. Yes. Now, in the course of your life, you've been able to, I think, record in different, I think, was it 50 or 60 different countries? Almost 70 now. Almost yeah. 70 different countries. Yeah. Talk about one or two of your favorite experiences there. I know there's a couple that get regurgitated frequently with almost falling out of an airplane and different things yeah. of that nature. But talk about one or two of your stories that are maybe, you know, either the most fun or maybe the most impactful for you as you reflect on them. Well, it's interesting. We we did a project where we were documenting a medical team that was working in the headwaters of the Amazon River, way, 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 way up. And we took a we took a commercial flight to a city called Manaus, which is about halfway up the Amazon. And um, then we chartered a light plane and flew four or five hours further north and landed on a or further west and landed on a uh, dirt field. Then we chartered a freighter and we went two days on the freighter, just going deeper and deeper into the headwaters and. Then we took a canoe. Uh, we had a series of canoes because we had a lot of film equipment and gear for another day. And we finally we were going to a tribe that was not a very friendly tribe. I mean, the rumors were if they didn't invite you in, you might not have a chance to get out. And we go into the, the, the tribe and there's thatched huts everywhere, but we couldn't find anybody. There was nobody there. And we go in the first hut, nobody in it. Next hut, nobody in it. Next hut, nobody in it. Finally, we get to the very last hut down at the end. We go in and the entire village is crammed into this thatched roof hut and they're surround they're surrounding a beat up black and white TV set that's being powered by a car battery and they're watching an episode of Dallas. Remember that TV show that came on <laughs> years ago in the 70s and 80s Dallas. I thought these poor people are going to get so screwed up if that's what they're listening to and watching. And at that moment, I realized the power of media was unbelievable. I mean, these yeah. I was as far away, deep in the jungle as I could get. And if a, an atomic blast had gone off anywhere else, we would have never known. And yet, guess what? They're watching a television set powered by a car battery, watching an old black and white episode of Dallas. And um, so it just, I've seen that all over the country. I don't think, you know, today, fast forward to today, I've been to incredibly remote places in China, Mongolia, India, places like that. There's always a cell phone. Everybody's still watching on their phone. They're talking to people on their cell phone. It's just amazing how ubiquitous digital media has become. So it's really dramatically changed the world we live in. And I'm not so sure it's in good ways all the time, but uh, it's really quite fascinating. Oh, that's so good. Now, another one of your books that you've written, um, I believe it's called, is it The One Big Thing? Yep. Mm -hmm. Discovering what you were born to do. Yes. So I think that becomes a question for a lot of people at some point in their life. Yeah. Right. Um, some people it happens early on. Some people it happens in a second or third career. Right. Like, man, I really yeah. thought once I hit this peak or once I hit this level of yes. success, then I would feel like I, I found what I'm meant to do. And all of a sudden they wake up and they hit that and they almost feel less fulfilled than they did before they hit their goal that they've been chasing. That's true. So well, talk about that. 
It's an interesting question. Uh, it, you know, along with producing a lot of our own content and programming and films and things, I, I from early on, I started consulting with leaders, especially helping them understand how to use media effectively. I mean, everybody's got a message. Everybody has a passion or a purpose they're trying to accomplish out there, whether it's a, a business person, whether it's a, 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 you know, a nonprofit leader, whether it's a pastor, whatever, they all have messages they want to share with the culture and make an impact out there. And so I really helped them. And over those years doing that, I've noticed something about both successful organizations and successful individuals. And the, that is that the people that really break through, the people that get on the radar, that get noticed, that make an impact are generally not people who are pretty good at a lot of things. Yeah. They're people who are extraordinary at one big thing. Yeah. And I've learned that if you can focus, focus, focus and be amazing. I mean, every, you know, everybody's pretty good at different things, but the few people that are extraordinary at one thing, they're the ones that really, really stand out. And that goes, that goes along with branding your organization. What perception do you want to have out there? It's just an important aspect. I, for instance, I tell directors when they come to Hollywood film directors that look, when you come out here, if you're coming as a director, that means you're co competing against everybody. You're competing against Quentin Tarantino and Martin Scorsese and Steven Spielberg. But why don't you come out here as a director of a certain niche film, maybe a certain budget level, maybe a certain style, maybe a certain story, maybe a certain type of film, because suddenly in that niche or in that niche, as some people say, um, your, your competition is so much less and you have a chance of standing out so much more. Yeah. And so over the years, I've really learned that, that figure out what that one bit, we know that, that it is funny. Very often other people notice it before we do. I mean, think about your high school prom. I, I was on the planning committee and I remember sitting around a table saying, well, Bob, you're really creative. Why don't you come up with a theme for this year? And Susan, you're great with people. Why don't you be the host? Um, Sam, you're great with numbers. Why don't you do the budget? Other people notice what we're good at and we rarely think about it, but I encourage people go back and think about what are the things that people noticed about you, the things that stood out for you for years. I directed a number of big ESPN sporting events, basketball, boxing, things like that. And these premier athletes would tell me, well, Phil, I just, I can always catch the football better than anybody in my neighborhood, or I was always faster than everybody. Find out what it is about you that really makes you unique and different. That is what's going to put you on the map. And and the more you can develop that, the better it'll be. I love it. I hope that made sense. <laughs> makes perfect sense. And a couple of <laughs> things that are running through my head as, as you go through that is one, you know, and this could be a life principle. It could be a business principle who you're serving. Yes. But it's that, you know, if you try and be something to everyone, inevitably, you're not going to be the best oh, yeah. version of yourself to anyone, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, it's interesting. I have a whole chapter in my book on creativity about saying no. We have to learn to say no. I, I, uh, Warren Buffett, one of my favorite quotes ever is from Warren Buffett, who said, the difference between successful people and really successful people is that really successful people say, say no most of the time. Yeah. And it's really true. If you really feel that you have a purpose in life, that you have a significant thing to accomplish with your life, you're going to have to say no to a lot of other things. And some of them may be really good but you're going to have to say no to them to start focusing and freeing up that time and having that margin to really concentrate on what you feel your purpose really is. I, I agree. And I think, you know, the, the book, you know, or the saying, you know, good is the enemy of great, right? Yes. Um, it, 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 when things are good, it oftentimes causes us to not explore or find out what could be great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other part that I would say about that comment of saying no is, I think oftentimes if we're not clear on really where we're trying to go, distract yes. distractions can be uh, masked as opportunities, but they're not really helping us get to that ultimate thing we're focused on. Right. And we can start That's saying good. yes to four or five different opportunities, but those four or five are distracting from the one ultimate place that we're really trying to drive. Boy, that's true. And, and many times those, those distracting opportunities are what I call small wins. You know, yeah. how often do we come in the office and we have that one big task that we're supposed to focus on that day. It may be working on my book. It may be preparing a report. It may be, you know, doing whatever. But we think, you know what, that's really hard. Maybe I can answer email for, a, for an hour and knock off a bunch of those. And, it, and we feel good about ourselves. Yeah. But that was those were small wins. We need to focus, you know, create that time, guard our time so we can concentrate on the big wins because that's really what's going to take us to the next level in our career. That is so good. And by the way, by the way, I, I did, I tell people, if you spend your day responding to other people's emails, 
you're spending your day responding to other people's priorities. Yeah. And so, um, you know, you, maybe you need, need to take some time and focus on your priorities and what you really feel your purpose is and what you're called to do. Yeah. Well, and, you know, here's a, here's a good actionable item for someone to take away. And this is something I try and reprioritize about every quarter is the, the quadrants. And I break it down into yeah. important and urgent, important, but not urgent urgent, but not overly important and not important, not urgent. Right. And when you can yes. break up the tasks or the things that are popping up in your day, it really allows you to your point to focus on, all right, what is it? What is the most important thing I could do today? If nothing else got done versus, well, I checked eight things off of my, you know, to-do list, but the yes. two that I didn't check off were, the, were really the only ones that matter. Yes. That's good. And I go further. The ones that aren't important and aren't urgent. I just delete, I just delete those. Um, because probably not going to get you anywhere anyway. Yeah. A, a mentor of mine told me, he said, Phil, if it sits on your list for two weeks and you didn't do it, time to go. Right. You know, oh, as soon as we're done with this conversation, I have a few, I'm going to go upstairs and delete based <laughs> on that. That's a good line. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So Phil, talk a bit about what you're doing now and what you're actively working on at this point. Sure. It's interesting that, uh, you know, when, when things shut down for the pandemic, I thought we're going to be out of business. Um, but I'll tell you, we were flooded with calls from business leaders, from church leaders, nonprofit leaders, because they realized how much they needed to connect online with their audience, their congregation, their supporters, donors, whatever. And so I ended up working harder, I think, in the last two or three years that I've worked for a long, long time before that. Um, it was interesting to see. And, and I started doing Zoom teaching things. I, yeah. I, I was Zooming with leaders in Russia and Australia and South America and, and Africa. And it was just interesting to help people really engage. Uh, we've been doing it so much internationally. We actually launched a nonprofit called the Influence Lab, mm -hmm. whose purpose is to help train international leaders to use media more effectively. There's such a hunger, but they don't have the resources and the tools and the training that we have access to here in the U.S. or in Europe. And so, you know, we've we've taken teams to Cairo, Egypt. We've taken teams to multiple cities in, in India. We've taken teams all over. And it's just really fascinating. And so I, I think things are bigger than ever. Um, my wife is mentoring a group in, of women here in Hollywood. And um, so I, I just think there's a lot of opportunities because people just don't know how to deal with this digital world we live in. And it's changing everything so quickly that um, leaders need to understand what's at stake and how important it really is. Well, and I, I heard you in an interview say something that I thought was very interesting and profound. And it's not to diminish or demean anyone that is giving their time and going overseas and doing mission trips. But it was right. the fact that leaders of certain spots were saying, you know, yeah, we appreciate it. But if you could teach us tech skills or if you could help us with, uh, you yes. know, development of a website, like that would be exponentially more impactful. So talk a little bit about that, because I thought that was a really interesting yeah. uh, conversation you had. Well, that's true. And, and it's interesting that when you think about it, the most you know, the lar by population, the largest country on the planet is Facebook. <laughs> and um, and yet nobody thinks of sending missionaries there or trainers there. And so I think there's this just huge need out there online for people. We, we've got to stop thinking about training and missions and things like that in terms of geographical boundaries and start thinking about them in terms of digital boundaries. And I think the mission field of the future is online and certainly the marketplace of the future is online to a great degree. And, and, and I'm, trust me, I'm a people person. I love to be face to face with people. I like engaging with real people. I love our team and we're together and we're filming a project, but we have to be more and more conscious of just about how that matters when we're helping people internationally use media more effectively, because it's just, I can't express just, and, and, and the funny thing is, there's no place on the planet where you won't find an iPhone. I mentioned it earlier, but I mean, I, I was with a, um, I was with a, a, an African tribe in the heart of the bush country and they were all out walking around talking on their phones. And it's just, you know, you don't expect that. And yet it's there, go to Nepal, they're on their phones. So um, it's just interesting to see how that's changed the world. And we need to adapt to that new world that we're living in if we're gonna be effective. Yes. Well, Phil, I wanna exit or kind of end our time on this sure. question. And, you know, we, we referenced how, serendipitous you know you meeting your wife was at, at a yeah. uh, you know church service and her saying yes even though she thought it was a different guy and you know it working out yes. 
But as I hear your story, I hear a lot of changes and no marriage is easy. However, um, having someone that is in your corner supporting you, even as, hey, what I signed up for is no longer the case, right? What I signed up for, no longer the case, but still having your support. Talk a little bit about that dynamic for you guys and how that's been. It's really true. It's really true. Um, I, I, one of the things that bothers me the most is, um, that I don't, I just don't think people put the commitment and energy into a marriage as maybe they used to in the past. Uh, I, I can tell you this working for all these years in Hollywood, the single greatest reason people come to Hollywood and fail, I think is because the, the partners are not on the same page, the husband, the wife, they're not on the same page. And I, I was meeting with a couple just recently and he was a screenwriter. They came out, they've been out here for six months. They dreamed of, you know, him being a screenwriter. And um, they were at a point where she said, okay, I don't want to live in Hollywood, but I'll give you six months. I'll go with you. We'll give it a shot. Well, six months has gone by and he hasn't sold anything yet. Hasn't sold a script. And she said, okay, you know, it's time I I kept up my end of the bargain. It's time to go back to Indiana because I want to be near my family and live back there. And he's struggling because he thought, oh man, I I feel like I'm closer than ever, but you know, she's right. She said she'd come for six months and then we needed to go back. And I thought that's just a terrible place to be. And so first of all, before you launch out into something, whether it's starting a new business or moving to a new city uh, or changing careers, make sure you're both on the same page. That makes such a big difference. And, you know, in many ways, Kathy and I were married early enough that we didn't have any, uh, we didn't have any, you know, any ideas. We didn't have anything written in stone in our lives and we've grown together. Um, But you're right. After 40 years, you become different people. We, you know, there are many different things uh, from how we started. And so, but you have to be committed and stick with this. And I just think that it makes such an incredible difference. And we've got two amazing daughters that are both in the business. One's an actress, one's a musician and a son-in-law who's a, who's got about a million followers on TikTok. And um, we're seeing them go into whole nother levels of the industry that I never dreamed about. So I think the family is just so much more important. I think, I don't want to get political, but I think when no fault divorce came out and suddenly it was just so easy to get a divorce. I just saw so many families crumble because suddenly they didn't feel like it was worth sticking it out and really going, you know, really working through this. And there've been some very difficult times in our marriage, but I think just the commitment makes a dramatic, dramatic difference. And um, so I, I, now looking back, I, I couldn't be happier. I think, you know, it's, we're in a great place. We're leaving tomorrow to go overseas. We're going on a trip to Germany tomorrow. And um, I, I, I can't think of anybody I'd rather take with me. I love it. Well, Phil, I want to say thanks so much for highlighting your story and just some of the pivotal moments that have led to where you're at. I mean, we, we could spend hours talking about, you know, each each part of it, but uh, I appreciate you giving kind of a condensed version and excited to see all the amazing things you continue to do, the next book you're going to write and the next uh, show you're going to produce. And uh, just promise me, you know, hey, maybe it's two years from now we get to hop on, do it again and uh, look at some of the uh, new pivotal moments that have come. I'd love to do that because I, like I say, you, the whole concept of your podcast is brilliant. I'm just a huge fan. And um, now you've made me go back and I'm going to start thinking about these pivotal moments <laughs> more. And I uh, hope I have a few left before the end of the runway. We'll see. <laughs> well, thanks again, Phil. Thank you.